Joining us now, professor at Harvard University, Pulitzer Prize winning author Annette Gordon-Reed. Her new book is entitled On Juneteenth, and it's great to have you on. Annette, thank you great so much here. for being here. And I've been excited uh, about this book for some time. It's, it's personal to you, obviously, for so many reasons. But there's a whole lot of Texas in this book. Uh, tell us, <laughs> yes, tell yes. us uh, why, you, why you wrote about your home state so much, focused on it so much here. Well, my editor, Bob Wild, has been after me for a number of years now to write about Texas because I talk <laughs> about Texas a lot. And I've spent my life writing about Virginia, Jefferson and Monticello and the Hemings family and so forth. And I have a family, too. And I have a family history. And so we decided that I would do something, not the big book yet, but just a small book that talked a little bit about what the holiday meant to me, but at the same time, giving me an opportunity to talk about the history of Texas through my family story. So we just decided to do it. Well, and, and one thing that um, I, I learned from your book that um, that really was a stark reminder of how long it took for emancipation to come mm. to Texas was the fact that it, it was another two years after Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation where any any land that the North took over immediately, uh, at least in theory, became free. Uh, that didn't happen in your home state for another two years. Well, the Army of the Trans-Mississippi kept fighting. And they finally, they won the last battle, but they realized after Appomattox, everything had fallen apart. And they surrendered. And then that gave Gordon Granger, Major General Gordon Granger, the opportunity he was sent to Galveston to announce the news that slavery was over in Texas. And... That was a momentous occasion, but it was also just the beginning of something. As that excerpt uh, suggests, the question was, what happens after that? And we have the hindsight to know what happened, but the people at the time were jubilant that this was over, that the institution yeah, of legalized slavery was over for mm -hmm. them in Texas. Right. Yes. And, and Juneteenth was first celebrated in 1866. Talk about the development of that date. Well, initially, people had spontaneous uh, shows of, of celebration that were immediately tamped down. We have stories about people who were celebrating in 1865, and they were whipped because of that. There was a backlash against these celebrations. But then the Freedmen's Bureau, once it was established, uh, used these kinds of celebrations to encourage people to come to learn to read and to talk to them about the potential for voting rights and so forth. So it became an educative thing. And it was also associated with church. I, I think that a lot of times they had them in churches to try to, they thought that it might stave off violence. Uh, people might not attack them there. That didn't necessarily work all, all the time. But it was a gradual thing where People celebrated it as Emancipation Day. It wasn't called Juneteenth from the very beginning. It was Emancipation Day that just grew over time and remained something that was important to Texans. A group of black men in Houston bought some land in the 1870s to turn into a park specifically for the celebration, Emancipation Park, that's still in Houston today. Uh, Eddie Glaude, Jr. has the next question. Professor? Hi, Eddie. How are you doing? Annette, congratulations on this one. Hi, good morning, and congratulations on this wonderful book. It's, it's always important to talk about, you know, this alternative calendar, you know, from January 1st and the abolition of the slave trade as an important day in African-American history to August and the abolition of West Indian Emancipation Day and then, of course, Juneteenth. So talk a little bit about what this alternative calendar suggests about the nature of citizenship. And then the second part of the question a black citizenship, that is. The second part of the question would be this. How do you, th how might you think about the metaphor of the time lag for this conception of freedom over the course of American history and the way in which we think mm -hmm. about black freedom in this country? Both, I hope that makes sense. Well, it does make sense. I mean, the question of, of the different dates that you might use to celebrate the end of slavery, whether it's December 1865, with the final ratification of the 13th Amendment, legally in slavery everywhere. Uh, Juneteenth 
is the end of the sort of military, the organized military, recognizes the organized military uh, end of the Confederacy. Uh, uh, they surrendered before then, but this was the immediate result of that, that they could go into this large state and proclaim freedom. Gordon Granger could do that. It suggests that it's a process. Citizenship has been a process from Africa, for African Americans from the very beginning, from being considered mere denizens uh, as enslaved people outside of the civic life to being given legalized freedom with uh, legalized equality, I guess you could say, in citizenship uh, with the 14th Amendment. So there's no one day to celebrate it. They're just different moments. Uh, and the second part of your question, I'm sorry, uh, your second question. Yeah, it's this, it's, it's this, the, it's the notion of this time lag, right? That, that the oh, idea yes. of freedom well, comes late two years. How, how yeah. do you think about that? Well, it, it ties into the first question that it's, it's not over yet. Exactly. My father, who could be quite sardonic <laughs> when we would celebrate Juneteenth, uh, he would say the f slaves haven't been freed yet. Now, I mean, now he understood that legalized freedom, uh, slavery was over. But what he meant was there were still many, many things to do and that the problem of white supremacy that was exacerbated and sort of got baked into things during slavery was still something you had to combat. So it's, it's not over. It was just a process. And we've, we've been struggling uh, since that time period to realize the hopes that the people at that time had for this day. I mean, I look at the day and I think, well, I know what's going to happen. <laughs> I know there's going to be violence. There's going to be Jim Crow. There's going to be lynching. There will be civil rights movement, all those kinds of things to combat that. But at the time, this was a moment of hope. And commemorating this day for me is about commemorating the hope of people who had been treated as chattel and who now thought that they were going to begin the journey. Because I think they knew that it wasn't going to be immediate. They knew that, that legalized slavery, being bought and sold, the separation from families, all those kinds of things, that's what they hoped would be over immediately. But they knew that they that there would be a long road ahead of them, and it has been. Yeah, so just a quick follow-up. I mean, Juneteenth is, you know, it's not, a, it's, it's broadly celebrated. I grew up in Mississippi. We didn't quite celebrate Juneteenth, but we understood it. We knew about it. Mm -hmm. So, so mm -hmm. what mm -hmm. do you think will be the impact or how should we read your book, Annette, against the backdrop of some of the current debates around whether or not America is still racist or the like? I mean, it's an interesting kind of convergence for you to tell your story and for it to enter into this political moment where you have this broad set of considerations about whether or not the country is, is, is still racist. Well, how, do, how would you think about uh, uh, the book landing in this particular moment at this particular time? Well, it's a time to reflect on why we are where we are now, uh, to have people think about the fact, as I suggested before, slavery was an economic system, a labor system, but it was a cultural system as well. It was a system that put in place an idea, and I guess well, the idea was already there, but baked into American society an idea about white supremacy. And it's sort of naive, I would think, to believe believe that you could rid the country of that in a short amount of time. And the book is a chance, I sort of go through history and I talk not just about those times, but I talk about being um, a six-year-old and integrating our schools in my hometown, that I was there continuing this mission <laughs> that was started back in 1865, back well before then, but certainly connecting it to Texas, this idea of realizing a place when Texans and black and white could live in the state on a basis of equality. So I, we are still on this march, and I think the book is a time to reflect upon that. It's not, it's not just a triumphant thing. It was never meant to be a triumphant thing. It's a, an educative thing to think about where we are and where we want to go in the future. We're not so far away from you know, all this stuff. This is the thing that's amazing about it. Yeah, you know, Annette, it's so interesting. You talk about being six, and 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 be the year that schools were integrated in in Texas. 
I, I've been reading an awful lot about Abraham Lincoln. And, you know, we, you know, John Didion uh, has a collection of stories that are called uh, stories we tell ourselves uh, so we can go to sleep tonight. Uh, and yes. you know, we'd love to talk about Abraham Lincoln freed the slaves. OK, that mm-hmm. that that statement, while true, uh, glosses over so much as, as I've been really diving into Lincoln's history, 30s, 40s, 50s. And, and you know, even talking about colonization after the emancipation. And I'm reminded of my first year in, in school in Meridian, Mississippi, sixth grade, integrated. And there are so many things I look back on that I'm really proud of, of, of examples mm-hmm. that teachers, white young teachers, gave us uh, examples of, of, of the friendships uh, with black kids, the white kids that I didn't even think anything of because that's what school was to me. But then I look over the 30 or 40 years and I think about, like you said, there's so many uh, ups and downs. We're still just like Lincoln from the 30s through 1865. We're still on our journey. And for every two steps forward, it seems we take one back. Yeah, it's a tough thing. I mean, it's a question of who the people are. I mean, Lincoln certainly struggled with that. The idea that blacks and whites, a question of whether blacks and whites could live in this society with some degree of harmony. And he and others, the person I write about all the time, Jefferson, didn't think that, that it was possible that there would always be conflict and you couldn't have first class and second class citizenship. So the idea was that black people should be someplace in their own country where they could be first class citizens there. It wasn't going to happen here. Hey, thanks so much for watching our YouTube channel. You can follow up on today's top stories and breaking news or catch up on your favorite MSNBC shows all in one place. Download the NBC News app today.